Welcome and thank you for joining Current Issues and Analysis here on TVG Channel 28. I am your host for today, Daniel Singh. I have with me Captain Jerry Govaya, who is joining us as Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director for the Roraima Group of Companies. And we will be talking about Roraima's 20th anniversary celebrations, which took place just recently. We will also be talking about what lies ahead. And Captain Govaya, you are no stranger to anyone here in Guyana. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to ask you first of all to tell us about the Roraima story, how it began 20 years ago, your leadership, uh, your challenges, your motivation, your inspiration. What has been the major highlight or, may or maybe several highlights over the past 20 years? Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, you know, this is our 20th anniversary and it was interesting because in 1992 it was a time when Ghana was changing. And um, Guyana was changing from a product-driven economy. And I basically looked forward into what was happening and recognized that services will have to become a major part of our economy. And so um, a lot of what I projected to do um, for those next 20 years and hopefully for the next 20 from now had everything to do with, um, with, what, with my training. I am a, a recipient of a government scholarship. Um, and I went to one of the, luckily, you know, the government, I, I was fortunate and I was uh, given a scholarship to go to one of the world's best, uh, most prestigious aviation universities, the Emerald Aeronautical University. So when it was time for me to, um, after I left the military, to start with Rima Airways, um, it was to get into what I love to do, um, which was, uh, which is aviation and tourism. At the time, I will confess to you that tourism was not as big as a passion, um, but aviation was everything for Aviation security was everything for me at the time. And I looked forward and I understand that we needed, we needed to prepare for what was going to happen in the future. Um, and I think I would say to you 20 years down the road, having looked back now, I would say that we have done a wonderful job, me and my team. Um, Raima today, we boast 200 staff of phenomenal young people. We have taken ordinary young Guyanese and brought them into the Raima team. And these ordinary Guyanese today are doing extraordinary things um, as managers and supervisors and operatives of the Raima group of services. And that group of services span close to 10 or, or 15 divisions um, covering every sector from issues of security, issues of hotels, resorts, um, airline a aviation catering, um, you know, the, the, the ground handling operations, the lounges, and the international travel agencies. So it's amazing. So in any one day, Baraima, as we are moving people in our planes, we're moving people in our boats, we have people riding mountain bikes in the jungle, we have, we're loading people onto jets, people are in our hotels, in our restaurants, in our bars, um, we're providing uh, first class aviation security services um, to international airlines. And they're, so where I'm a team today and, and over the last many, many years have been doing a wonderful job to bring us to where we are t today and um, to meet the challenges of this economic development, this economic trajectory that has been happening over the last years and to continue to meet where we are going um, as a country. Um, so. It started back with me having the um, having this vision of where Guyana will go, and Guyana was destined for um, a burst of economic development, but where our service sector was weak back 20 years ago, and I recognized that part of what we were going to do was contribute to that service sector, and I think we did it very, very well. Well, you talked about that vision going back to 1992. Prior to that, and perhaps in the late 80s, mid 80s, not many Guyanese shared that vision. And you also mentioned your staff, ordinary Guyanese, doing extraordinary things. But you, the man, Jerry Govaya, you yourself have done extraordinary things. You're, what, CEO and, and managing director of your group of companies, former president of the George Young Chamber of Commerce and Industry. You have been involved heavily in the private sector, a leading figure, private sector commission, Tourism and Hospital Association of Guyana. How did you, and many others which uh, I'm not able to mention right now, but how did you as the man, as the leader, 
how were you able to pull all of this together? A company, as, as head of a company that is still growing and, and, and you still plan to expand. Well, I, I will say first of all, I, um, I am joined. This company is owned equally by myself, my wife, Debbie Gavaya. Debbie Gavaya is a wonderful, wonderful partner, wife, mother of my children. But she is a professional woman of world-class caliber, um, extremely humble, but she's a first-rate pilot as well, just like I am. And while I've been doing all these things over the years, she has been the one that has been carrying um, the company behind me. She has been there bringing up the rear, taking care of business. While I was out here, um, really in a, in, a, in, a very, in a very determined way, uh, meaning to contribute to make Guyana a better place because I recognize that early that if I even if my business was successful but the society around my business was not as successful was not as conducive that we, we could not be an island you could not be an island in a, in a country like this and we needed to contribute to make Guyana a better place because where were we getting our customers from where were we, we getting our staff from our staff children had to go to school and so on so I made a determined, um, a determined decision back then that um, we had to team up. One would do the work. Um, certainly, I would bring my experience and the things to the table, my own style of leadership. But with Debbie there, we jointly did that together. But when I came out in the private sector and started to work alongside other private sector colleagues of equally determined private sector leaders like myself, we were determined to contribute to make Ghana a better place. And what I did, I believe, I contributed maybe 50 or 60% of my time over this 20 years to making the private sector an integral part of our national development and contributing our voice and our efforts and our money to making sure that never again are we going to allow politicians alone to run this country. Um, never again are we going to allow that type of administration of a country that will, that will destroy the private sector. The private sector stood, stood by and was destroyed in the 80s, um, in the 70s and 80s. The private sector was annihilated. We had 95% of our economy was controlled by the state. Unacceptable, should never happen again. And so I was determined to work with my private sector colleagues to make sure the private sector was unified. So while I was doing that, um, 60% of my time was there um, in tourism development because, of course, we came from a time when our nation leaders were saying we did not want to have a nation of waiters and servants, and they, didn't want, they did not want to embrace tourism as an economic tool for development either. So the believers and the advocates for tourism development had a, a serious challenge in, in, in convincing not only government leaders but ordinary Guyanese that the rainforest, the rainforest was just not bush but it was a rainforest of rich diversity and that, um, that tourism is not only sun, sun and sea like Barbados and St. Lucia, that our eco and adventure tourism was phenomenal and the economic potential of it could create enormous economic activity in our country. So for me, while I was doing that, um, Debbie basically brought up the rear, um, looking after the company, doing the things that needed to be done and that is how I was able to do it. And then she was joined by a team of uh, wonderful young Guyanese, um, talented, hardworking. And at Roraima, because the company is such a diverse and exciting company, every day the staff was there and we, we continued to expand the services and meet the challenges with a lot of determination. And so that is how it happened. And today, um, I would say that we have um, brought it full circle. So today we have uh, complete the, all the synergies and vertical integration. So from the time a person arrives at the airport, we meet them, we greet them, put them in our, in our air conditioned buses, bring them to our hotel, they eat at our restaurant, drink at our bars, fly in our planes, um, go in our boats, our resort, go to Kaichiro Falls. And when they're leaving, they're checking in at the Roraima check-in counter um, and sitting in our executive lounge before they board the plane back out, out to Diana. And I think that it took a long time to put the modules together. It's there today and it's a wonderful conglomerate of services. I have from time to time interacted with some of your staff, wonderful as they are. And uh, I gather that your leadership is as dynamic as you, as your expressions here in this interview. Um, on a more lighter side, 
Do you really get spare time? Ah, a lot of it. What's a, what's, it. what's a normal day <laughs> like in your life? Uh, let's say today, for instance, for, for, for example. Well, today we are building the hangar oval. But in my regular day, I would fly my planes. I would get up. I would um, fly my planes sometimes. But I, am, I, I, I attend a lot of meetings of the private sector. Um, to do with tourism. I am members of um, the Law and Order Commission with Minister Rohi. Um, and yeah, with security, you're involved uh, in as well. I'm, I'm very much involved in issues of security. And, um, but I fly my planes, I run, I, I visit the airport, I deal with my staff at the airport, I go to the resort. But um, I am not as busy as I look because I spend a lot of time on my mountain bike. I love riding in the jungle. I love going off in the jungle by mountain bike for hours and, and um, and put it on a backpack with some sandwiches and go off there and explore in the and, and so yes I, I enjoy doing that. So while Roraima is very exciting um, and it took a lot of time setting it up. But now I have wonderful staff that run it every day and um, and I basically would overlook it. And I still I have a I have a lot of time to go kayaking and to go mountain biking or go walking to the bottom of Kaichou Falls and that is where my passion is today to discover more and more of Guyana every day. We started out, or you started out by explaining your vision back in 1992 and just prior to that. And at that time, the reality would not have been as it is today. What has been your experience with uh, government in terms of uh, your interaction with various regulatory bodies that you would have had to uh, be doing business with for your businesses, uh, for your expansion, you know, for your growth? It's interesting that you ask the question because many people today would say that the private sector is somehow a puddle of government, that the private sector is somehow um, subordinated to government. And people who say that, I believe, they're ignorant of the fact. Ignorant of the fact that where we came from, I remember when I first got involved in the private sector in the early 90s, the private sector was in constant conflict with government. They're <coughs> constantly in, in public, um, uh, public outbursts against the government. And the private sector sometimes operates with a lot of arrogance. Um, and you know, the, the, they sometimes believe that government officers, whether it's public servants, that somehow because public servants are operating by different rules and regulations, the, the circumstances for the public servant and their accountability systems, they cannot, we cannot expect them to move as fast as we could in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I thought there was a high level of intolerance by the private sector operatives against government officials, whether they are public servants or, or politicians. And so the private sector had a very, sometimes I believe, um, unfair behavior to public servants. And when they were not um, operating as fast, we kind of condemned them. And we, so we constantly were putting heads together with the public service. I, took, I think it took, it took a while. I became the president of the Tourism Association in 1996. And I believe very much in the concept of dialogue. I believe very much in the concept of compromise. And I remember Sri Chan was the Minister of Tourism at the time. The truth of the matter is many government people did not understand the concept of tourism. I think, I, and I, I we used to joke that the government supported ecotourism by echoing what they hear. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, but I will tell you, we've seen the transformation over the years. But in those days, there was a conflict, constant conflict. What I found is that so long as the private sector decided to embrace a responsible approach to responsible engagement and constructive engagement with, the, with government, we started to see results. And I ask the question all the time, as a leader of the Tourism Association, the leader of the Chamber of Commerce, what is my objective? My objective is to bring benefit to my, um, to my members. And how do I bring member, How do I bring that? Th those. Those. Um, how do I bring the benefit? I bring the benefit through constructive dialogue, constructive engagement with the policymakers, so that when we we meet Sri Chan, we ask him what was his ideas, what was his intention. We would then create the atmosphere where he could listen to us, and then somewhere in between that we could come to a compromise, mm -hmm. and that is what we started to do. So for me, while in the early stages, it was very it was very acrimonious. I think it changed over the years because government, I believe, need help. The government officials um, genuinely wanted to work with the private sector, but I found that the private sector sometimes are very hostile. 
and because we were, we had all this big ego and we walked with them with our money bags and our back and so on, but finally we were able to to shed that kind of of arrogance. And I think we started to work in a constructive manner and started to bring value and benefit to our members. And so to ask me about that, I will say that we have contributed by that kind of constructive engagement in helping to create an enabling environment for private sector development to happen. And, it, and you need both government and the private sector, and labor, of course, uh, but particularly because I'm talking with these two, for us to work together in an environment um, where Guyana is, is, is the priority. How do we compromise together, respect each other's rule, um, and put Guyana first? And I will say to you that whether we were talking about aviation and the development of aviation, and if you look today, if you went to Ogle Airport and you see the development that has happened at Ogle Airport over the last 15 years, is mind-boggling. And that development there is not only physical development, it's also development that happened with people putting their money where their mouth is, with highly skilled professionals staying in Guyana and helping to develop Guyana. That aviation sector is like the backbone for our national development because that is what will connect our urban areas with our, with our hinterland areas. Mm -hmm. And you look at that, and that could only happen because the enabling environment was created. And so the regulatory environment came in, and I will say that throughout the system, the regulators were always ready to meet in a cordial manner to talk to the private sector, and the private sector was able to contribute to that process. I'm not saying it's always perfect, mm -hmm. but <coughs> I am actually extremely optimistic and very, very in choose by where we are, what we've been able to achieve. And so people mistake constructive engagement to bring results to your members. So if you had a problem with customs, at one time it was going to be a nightmare of bureaucracy to get to solve those problems. Today, if, if we have a problem in customs, if there's a problem with regulations, with our planes, with tourism, at the airport, I mean, very, very quickly private sector delegations engage government officials and those things are quickly resolved to mutual benefits. And, it, and that is for the interest of Guyana. So I would say that we've come a far way and the regulators and the environment that we operate in today, I believe, is extremely con conducive to economic development. Though that, and I'm sorry to, to go on on this point, but to say to you, this wonderful working relationship and this wonderful enabling environment um, is, is being challenged as we speak because, um, you know, the greatest challenge facing Guyana today is still the creation of jobs. And how do you create jobs? You create jobs by fostering and enhancing investor confidence. That is the only way you create jobs. And jobs is what our young people need, and they need, they need better paying jobs. The only way we could do that is with enhancing investor confidence. How do you invest in, enhance investor confidence? Well, you have to first of all create that enabling environment, which we have, you know, the, the relationship with the private sector, the rule of law. The rule of law, very, very important. The issue of property rights that people can't come and destroy your property, the government can't seize your property, uh, property rights, the issue of, of copyrights. But more particularly and very important is the issue of political stability and peace and, and, and personal safety. Um, and I would say that all our leaders, all our leaders need to understand that if they, if they, if they could accept the fact that one of the most important things facing our country is the creation of jobs and to create jobs, you need to enhance investor confidence. And investor confidence will, is dependent on peace and security. So if any one of our leaders, if we do anything to disrupt that peace and security, it doesn't matter what your justification is. We are a democracy and a country that respect with law and order and rules and regulations. And if we have leaders that disrupt that peace and security and that stability, we are affecting the creation of jobs. And so we are affecting the very same people we are, we are professing to want to lead. So any political leader, private sector person, church leaders, union leaders, if any of the leaders in Ghana do anything to affect the investor confidence, then they are affecting the very people they are professing to want to lead. And I think all of us need to keep that in mind, that to make, to, to solve the major problem in Ghana, the creation of jobs, to, to promote economic development, we need to have a society where the rule of law is prevalent, where peace and security and political stability is predictable and stable. 
And if we do anything to disturb that, we are affecting the very foundation of what we want to do, the creation of jobs. Let's return to that important point you made regarding the political stability of yes. a country. Uh, government in, in, in recent years and before um, has basically moved away from direct ownership of various industries in the private sector or what now is in the private sector. Is government moving in the right direction? Should government really just facilitate growth in the private sector? Should it serve as a catalyst or should it sometimes over and beyond that, especially when national development is at stake and national growth? Should it kick start? Should it get involved at least at the initial stages and even help to fund uh, some of those projects which will in turn serve the purpose of national development and growth in the long run and also, also, mm, and also st uh, strengthen confidence in the private sector? Well, that is also an interesting um, dilemma for us because yes, the government, the, the private sector got the, really is the engine of growth, really is the engine that will create the economic development. The government got to be able to create the impetus, create the enabling environment, create and also contribute, and this is where the difference comes in, to what is known as transformational projects. Now, in terms of run-of-the-mill development of our country, um, the government need to get out of the way, allow the private sector to do what they do, regulate them, though. the government must of ensure course. That we have strong regulation, regulations in money laundering, many registry, um, regulations in tourism oversight, in aviation oversight, in the police doing their work, and so on. And that I would say that all the private sector um, fully endorse. That let the private sector develop. Let us let us encourage foreign investors into our country. Give them all of the conditions that they give the local private sector. No less, no more. But when you start to talk, you see a country like Guyana. We, we are coming from so far behind the rest of the world mm -hmm. that normally countries get in a level where their, their development is linear. You see, the, 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 as, even as you get close, it's a, it's a nice line going up. When you are coming from so far behind, behind from where Ghana is, you have to catapult, you have to catapult from one level to the next, right? Mm -hmm. And so the closer you get it, is if you, you see those, those jerks in the line. The farther you get from it, it looks like a linear curve. Right. The point is that when transformational projects is the one that will move us from here to there, mm -hmm. from here to there. And the way that happens is when you start to talk about big projects, big mega projects. And in Guyana, we, I could probably label maybe four or five of such projects. The road from Lethem, important. The road that will connect us with Brazil into that Atlantic coast, into a deep water harbor. I mean, that is amazing, opening up opening up that 400 miles of rainforest uh, where that road will pass and a possible railway line um, for, for, for housing and agriculture and tourism and so on. And then you think about the hydro, the Amelia Falls. Those are, those are transformational projects. You think about the Marriott Hotel. Um, you think about the, the new airport. Now, if you wait for the private sector to, to do that, remember our private sector was annihilated. Our private sector was <coughs> annihilated. So this private sector was only reborn under Desmond Height maybe in 1989 um, when it was given back a breath of, uh, of breath fresh air, you know, to start back. So under Desmond Height, the, the, the private sector started to, to rile up and it really got moving back up into the 90s and so on. So we are a relatively young private sector in comparison to the rest of the Caribbean that got private sectors that is decades old, I mean 50, 60, 100 years old. Our private sector basically, and those that survived during that time, had to survive by the skin of their teeth and all kinds of things they had to do to survive, to equip, to retool, and so on. The point is that our private sector, if we were to wait for our private sector to gear up, to take on the transformation projects, we'll wait a long time while the rest of the world is moving from us, while we have many, many young people looking for jobs and want an economy that is on the go. So for me, I understand the concept that while we want government out of the way, there are some projects which is necessary for government intervention. And I'll, I'll name one of them for, for you, for example, the Marriott Hotel. There are many people, um, and I believe a lot of it is politics, unfortunately. Every, every hoteler that I know, every hoteler that I know, have welcomed the Marriott in the Tourism Association, except the, 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 the owner for the Pegasus. And, and I think he's wrong. I think that we, the Marriott Hotel will, will catapult Guyana to our next level of service provision, 
of the training of staff, of standards in hotel rooms, standard of service, quality of service. And all of us need to look at the Marriott as a threshold for us to climb to. For me and my own small company, I am not waiting. I am, my, my hotel rooms and my service is being geared up to meet the challenge of the Marriott. And the Pegasus should, should do the same thing. Any serious hotelier will tell you that the Marriott presence in Guyana, first of all, the day that the Marriott Hotel agreed to brand this hotel, it was a tremendous, it was a tremendous achievement for Guyana as a country. It took about two to three years um, to convince the Marriott to come and do this. And when they did it, it was an achievement for Guyana. The benefits to, for Guyana and the tourism industry in Guyana, um, embracing the Marriott and, and, and benefiting from the Marriott marketing, Marriott attraction, because where the Marriott go, a lot of people follow. People follow Air Canada, mm -hmm. they follow American Airlines, they follow Delta, and they will follow the Marriott. We all could benefit from it. And the fact that the Pegasus is there, the Marriott is there, it will make that whole area a huge attraction. And so what we need to do is we should be happy that this is happening because I'll tell you what we are faced with. For many years, the image of Guyana, the perception of Guyana was left behind. And I always criticize the government for not spending enough money on marketing Guyana. So that the perception of Guyana was one that was very bad. There's all the word of mouth and every time we, because our newspapers print all these bad um, front page articles and these things are on the internet, people believe that the whole of Guyana is like that. And so the negative news predominates people's impression of Guyana. And I always criticize the government as saying you're not spending enough money to tell the world what a wonderful place we live in, what a wonderful country. People go to school, they go to church, we have business development happening, things are happening in Guyana. For me, I see Guyana through the eyes of my visitors. I have 5,000 people pass through our systems every year. And when I speak to those people, and they, and they are amazed with Guyana and Guyanese and what they're seeing. And overseas Guyanese that came back home would come back after years and they say, wow. So I constantly see Guyana through this new paradigm. And for me, um, it, 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 it's, it's a wonderful thing. So that when the Marriott happens and um, it will drive all of us up to that standard, the people who are criticizing the Marriott um, are, have not taken the whole picture, do not understand the whole concept. And the point I was making is that the government needs to spend a lot more money in marketing to tell the world truly what is happening in Guyana. Now, when they do that, um, and they haven't been doing it, but they will have to do it for the Marriott. The Marriott will have to up the marketing and an entire new, the Marriott is not going to be taking away the Pegasus or Roraima guests. The Marriott is going to be helping the contribute to bringing more people to the, to the, to the table. Okay. And that is how we must see it. So that um, the whole country would benefit and the marketing of Guyana, the image of Guyana would be catapulted to the next level, like happened with the low carbon development strategy. Mm -hmm. President Jack Dio himself had done a tremendous um, credit to Guyana with the low carbon development strategy to the extent that Guyana, the image of Guyana has catapulted to another, to another level. So we have people visiting us now when you see what happened in New York the other day, when you saw what that hurricane did to New York the other day, and you heard the scientists and the commentators, when they were talking, you could very well listen to President Jack, your voice behind that, warning people, warning, warning nations of the world and leaders of the world that you cannot ring fence your country. Climate change is here to stay. Jack, you have done that and catapulted Ghana at that level of respectability. So the Marriott will do the same thing for us. It will join that whole effort in catapulting Guyana and Guyana's image to another level. And that is where those transformational projects need to happen. So government intervention in transformational projects is very necessary. And it happened in other countries of the world. And we must not, be, we must not shy away from that. We must not shy away from that. Uh, Captain Jerry, I was beginning to wonder if you had a peep at my questions. Uh, because Already. you have preempted my last question in a sense of, um, how do you see the Marriott project influencing what you do in your hotel? But as part of your uh, anniversary celebrations recently, it was announced that uh, there is a Roraima, well, there is a Roraima brand hotel already. But announcement was made regarding a Roraima brand hotel. At Temeri. At Temeri. Yes. Um, coming soon. How soon is soon? And um, what are your plans? Well, I think our, our, as we project into the next five years of our development, 
And that's how we've been basically modeling our development in five-year modules. Um, we are probably looking at about 18 million U.S. dollars of, of expansion investment in the Guyanese economy at, at a, from a small company like Roraima. We are, um, at, as we speak now, if you went to Ogle, you will see our, our new grand hangar being put up, mm -hmm. our maintenance facility, and we are looking to, um, to import um, two new planes. The first one, will, it, 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 it cost probably in the vicinity of three to four million U.S. dollars, um, and then over the next um, couple of years, they're, they're going to be the addition to those airplanes. At Juke Lodge at the moment, um, we've already installed a brand spanking new state-of-the-art commercial kitchen that will do aviation catering, catering <coughs> for widespread events and public events and so on, to meet international standards of sanitation and food hygiene. And so that is already in place at Juke Lodge, just completed for, our for, for this month. We are also building um, a, a, a brand new banquet hall as well to do conferences and workshops and cocktails and so on and weddings at the Juke Lodge facility. And at Juke Lodge, we are also expanding into a turtle room, putting turtle rooms into our present facility. Um, and then we are looking to do the hotel at, at the airport. Um, already, we have a massive presence at the airport. We have our ground handling operations, our launches operations, our security operations, our tourism operations operate there. And so, to I believe coincide with the completion of the of the brand new um, expansion at the airport. We intend to put up maybe a 25 or 30 room hotel in the vicinity of that airport to, to take off the traffic from the airport to deal, with, to deal with our own tours that happen around that airport. So this is probably going to be in 2014. And I'll tell you something else that is extremely exciting that is on our drawing board at the moment is our plans to build a resort in Wakenham, um, the island of Wakenham. Um, I, as a pilot, I fly this country all the time. And one day I was flying back from the Machu Picchu area and I flying over the Wakenham Island. I saw the runway. I saw the new runway that, they, that was built on Wakenham Island. And I looked at it and I came back home and I discussed with my staff and I looked at it and I, it made a lot of sense. It's the first oceanfront resort we are going to build here in Guyana at Wakenham. It's, it's 11 minutes flying from Ogle. It's 12 minutes from Timiri. It's one hour from Kaicho Falls. And we are looking to put up a, a, a upgraded eco tourism resort on the island of Wakenham that will use the services of that runway where our planes will feed people into from the, from the international airport, from Ogle, that will take from, from Kaicho Falls, they will go there and have lunch. People will go horseback riding, mountain biking, kayaking, they'll be on the, on the ocean right over there. And um, so those are, that, is, that is all part of our five-year development plan. But it's because we are so optimistic of the future of Guyana. In fact, when we look at it, we see the next 10 years of the economy of Guyana. At, at, at a tremendous level. And that enthusiasm for me comes a lot when I speak to the IDB and I speak to foreign investors in the Caribbean, people who are looking at Guyana. A lot of times we have people in Guyana who are so pessimistic that they don't see the big picture. When you listen to people in the Caribbean and you listen to the IDB and you listen to people like that who talk about the economy of Guyana and what a rising star Guyana is in the world today, um, you can't help but be as enthusiastic as I am and positive about where Guyana is going. And, you know, I say to our overseas-based Guyanese, a lot of them are all over the world. They've done very, very well. We can't ask them to come back home. Maybe they, a lot of them are coming, but we could certainly ask them and remind them and remind a lot of people who are sometimes spreading a lot of misinformation and negativity about Guyana, false negativity, that there are still 700,000 people, 750,000 people here who need jobs and who have a life. And if you go out of Guyana, you keep, you keep pronouncing on all the negatives in our society, you're hurting these very people. You're hurting their opportunities for better life, creation of jobs. And so I think every Guyanese need to contribute to the positive image of Guyana. Certainly we, we are not perfect. Certainly we can have difference of opinion. We can have, there can be political differences but we must never ever hurt our country's public image and international image because we will hurt the very same people we are trying to help. Captain Govaya, I must uh, close by congratulating you on your 20 years of, of achievement, your management and your staff, and I wish you success in your continued endeavors here in Guyana in the private sector. I close by reminding our viewers that they were watching current issues and analysis here on TVG Channel 28. Thank you for joining us. I have been your host, Daniel Singh, on behalf of this channel.